Mr. Lowe. Mr. Lowe! Hello everyone, it's that time of the year when I make a video for NAIDOC week. This year it has been a little difficult to create a video because, as you may have heard on the radio or seen on the television, there have been a lot of restrictions as a result of the coronavirus. So, for this NADOC video, I've decided to stay home and do what I love most, and that is reading a story. The story that I've chosen to read is called The Rabbits, by John Marsden, illustrated by Sean Tan. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, NADOC week is about the Aboriginal people, so why am I reading a story about rabbits? Well, believe it or not, this story is actually about the Aboriginal people, and in particular, the European invasion of Aboriginal land. If you look closely at the illustrations, you can see that the rabbits are dressed in similar clothing to that of the Europeans when they arrived in Australia. And behind them, you can see a big ship, which is how they arrived here. So now you're probably thinking, okay, there's a ship, but why is it drawn so strangely? And, okay, they're wearing the same clothing, but why rabbits? Why not another animal? Well, this is exactly how you would feel if you saw a strange object heading towards you. And the Europeans didn't only bring themselves to Australia, they also brought many other things with them. And one of those things were rabbits. They used rabbits for their meat and their fur, but they soon caused many problems here in Australia. In parts of New South Wales, the impact was becoming serious. Plagues of rabbits stripped the ground of all cover. Very soon, much of the best pastoral country looked like a huge rabbit warren. Those rabbits really love to dig holes. There are many other themes in this story. You may even notice more than I have. Well, here it is, The Rabbits, by John Marsden, illustrated by Sean Tan. Mr. Lowe. The Rabbits, by John Marsden and Sean Tan. The Rabbits, by John Marsden and Sean Tan. The rabbits came many grandparents ago. At first, we didn't know what to think. They looked a bit like us. There weren't many of them. Some were friendly. But our old people warned us. Be careful. They won't understand the right ways. They only know their own country. More rabbits came. They came by water. And for Aboriginal people, can you imagine? Suddenly there are 11 ships of these strange people wearing clothes. Funny hats. They have guns. What are these people up to? Why are they here? How long are they going to stay? Why did they come to my country? Why don't they go somewhere else? Are they spirits? Very strange.
They didn't live in the trees like we did. They made their own houses. We couldn't understand the way they talked. They brought new food and they brought other animals. We liked some of the food and we liked some of the animals. But some of the food made us sick. A government report in the 1850s spoke of the success of poisoning Aborigines. 100 of them laid out at a time. But until quite recently, little of this was even acknowledged. In Tasmania, the Aborigines were said to have died out. Did you know that the Aboriginal people were deliberately given food that had been secretly poisoned? Even the water they drank from was poisoned. These are just a few examples. There are many more. I wonder if you'd believe this as a solution to the Aboriginal problem. Herd the worst of the Aborigines into one area and put a chemical in their water that sent them sterile. In time, there'd be none of them left. Well, that solution has been put forward by none other than one of the Premier's closest friends, West Australian mining magnate, Lang Hancock. And some of the animals scared us. The rabbits spread across the country. No mountain could stop them. No desert. No river. sacred sites, we have all our things in there. We live by the land. We don't go and destroy the land. The land is our mother. That's what we believe in. And if it's going to be taken away from us, it's like taking, you know, taking someone's life away. Still, more of them came. Sometimes we had fights. And 
open war seemed about this time to have commenced between the natives and the settlers. David Collins, Judge Advocate. With their livelihood at stake, the first Australians fight back. Hemingway unleashes his fury at their trespass into his territory. The papers report his raids, and his name once more spreads fear amongst the settlers. He had them frightened to death them while I was out there. He could be a mile away from them, set the scrub on fire. He knew which way the winds were going to go. He knew how the fire would run, and he'd burn them out, and he wouldn't have to be within Kui of them. Heard all the crops between Parramatta and Sydney Cove and break the legs on sheep and cattle so they could sustain their farm. In their attacks, they conducted themselves with much art. But where that failed, they had recourse to force and on the least appearance of resistance, made use of their spears or clubs. David Collins, Judge Advocate. Whether it was a grudge, whether he wanted revenge, whether he wanted to drive the British out, we can't precisely know. But uh, somewhere in there lies the answer. We were followed by a large body of natives, headed by Pemelwai, a riotous and troublesome savage who, in a great rage, threatened to spear the first man that dared to approach him, and actually did throw a spear at one of the soldiers. But there were too many rabbits. We lost the fights. The British declared Australia an empty land, in spite of the fact that there were tribes with a total population of at least 300,000, perhaps as many as a million. No one knew exactly, because the first Australians were not counted as human beings. Decimation was swift. Aboriginal blood carried no resistance to white disease. Lieutenant Brady, Royal Marines, reported in 1788, from the great number of dead natives found at every part of Sydney Harbour, it appears that the smallpox has made dreadful havoc among them. But not nearly as much havoc as massacre. No British colony was born under so cruel a star as Australia. They ate our grass. They chopped down our trees and scared away our friends. And this is how others regard the land. For the Aborigines, the history of mining in Australia is the story of brutal eviction without compensation. For example, at Mapoon in Queensland, the Aborigines refused to leave when the Queensland government awarded a lease to the giant Camelco company for bauxite mining. So armed police landed after dark, arrested the entire community, and burnt their homes, their church, their school and shops. That was 1963. There's no film record. Such atrocities were not news then. And stole our children. The policeman, under the simulation laws in this country, is the guy who's going to grab all us, grab my mothers and all up there and put them in a compound because they were half European or whatever or something like that. <laughs> they put them in a compound. And my old granny, my old black granny, she'll come up there and try to talk to us, but we weren't allowed to. She'd get put in jail or I'd be getting threatened to send up to places like Melbourne and Croker Island. The officials came for us with a policeman in the car and my mother said, you're not taking them. He said, well, I'll have to use this. 
if the dome padding is the case with the handcuffs in it, you know. But we, in our childish imagination, we thought it was a gun. And uh, we were both yelled in together, we'll go, we'll go, Mum, we'll go, you know. And, uh, and uh, he was very kind. He tried to be, you know, very kind. And he, my mother said, well, I'm going too. And uh, he still had her apron on and went 25 miles to the Nilliquin. And uh, we weren't there very long when the car took us then to Finley and on the train to Kutamandra. That's a train where well, my heard years later how my mother cried and cried and she went out. She had nowhere to go and she went out into the bush and my old aunt and them who were told of me as they were coming past a certain point right out on the outskirt of the Nelequin, they heard us moaning like an animal, you know, and they stopped the buggy and went over to see it and they discovered not that it was my mother lying under this tree and in the tall grass crying. She couldn't mo moaning, she couldn't cry anymore, you know. And uh, they had to care for her and look after her. But we were already on our own, the way or might have been in Kutamandra then, by then, you know, by train. But I often wonder how many other children were taken like that, just like animals, because our hearts were absolutely broken. <laughs> Rabbits, 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 millions and millions of rabbits. Everywhere we look, there are rabbits. Many Aboriginal labourers were paid in alcohol or tobacco if their wages were not stolen. In the early 1800s, a favourite spectator sport of white people in Sydney was to ply Aboriginal men with alcohol and encourage them to fight each other, often to the death. To addict them to the effects of alcohol and to gain some control over them. Denon had become so fond of drink that when any officers invited him to their houses, he was eager to be intoxicated. And in that state was so savage and violent as to be capable of any mischief. Governor John Hunter. The land is bare and brown, and the wind blows empty across the plains. Where is the rich dark earth, brown and moist? Where is the smell of rain dripping from the gum trees? Where are the great billabongs alive with long-legged birds? Who will save us from the rabbits? Australia was, and always will be, Aboriginal land. I hope you learnt something from this video. See you next time. Australia has the distinction.
distinction of being the only country in the world to have supplied uranium with the nuclear bombs, which its leaders allowed to be dropped by a foreign power on their own territory and their own people without warning. In the 1940s, the British were looking for somewhere to explode their new nuclear weapons. The central and western deserts of Australia were said to be ideal. Dr. Keith Locum, director of the Australian Radiation Laboratory said, there was the view in the back of everybody's mind that the land was unoccupied and likely to remain so. This view ignored the fact that an entire Aboriginal nation had lived on the land since before the arrival of Captain Cook. British history was conveniently repeating itself. More than 160 years earlier, all of Australia had been declared an empty land. At Maralinga and Emu Junction, between 1952 and 57, nine nuclear bombs were exploded. Yami Lester was 12 at the time. His people received no warning. This was early in the morning. I was up playing. Might have been around about seven. The sun was coming up. And it was a warm morning. And um, we heard two bangs. And um, old people saying something and then I heard the bang and I just went on playing with other kids too. Just black smoke come over and I thought it was a dust storm but it was too quiet for a dust storm and they just just rolling above the trees can pass over and, and after that I don't know how many days after but most of the people were sick and uh, we all got um, um, skin rash and diarrhea and sore eyes and uh, red red eyes and we couldn't open it and well, you open it and it was hurting and you know, tears and that all that and uh, I believe there was some people died because they um, we didn't have any proper treatment, you know, there were no white doctors or white nurses really. That's happened, I think, in 1953. Then in uh, 57, I went blind, yeah. 